Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the oh, 29th, or the 28th, I'm sorry, of the ninth month, which also happens to be the 10th of December, 2022. And we only have a few more days before, not counting this one, there's three more days before the first day of the uh, first day of winter, which would be the 10th month, right? But getting back on track, today we're going to be going over a sermon from Ebenezer Ernskeen. This is the elder brother of Ralph Ernskeen, which we already read one of his sermons anyways called Thy Maker is Thy Husband. And in that one, we covered the foretellings about their being eminent preachers during the time that Elohim's the cloud of Elohim's wrath would be turned from his people, specifically mentioning the Caledonians. And that happened in the 1700s. <clears throat> but they both were prolific orators. They both were helping the body at that time to be reformed. And they were separating from the Anglican church. And uh, it eventually led to the Puritans, which fled the country. Instead, like Yaakov not fighting his brother, he fled. And when they fled to the wilderness, that was also foretold in Revelation. But, ob willing, this is edifying for everyone. And it's going to be the wind of the Ruach HaKodesh, or the set-apart Ruach, blowing upon the dry bones in the Valley of Vision. This was preached in Tollbooth Assembly, Edinburgh, upon a fast day before the sacrament of our Master's Supper, 15 or March 15th, 1715. And this is specifically from the whole works of the Reverend Ebenezer Ernskeen, consisting of sermons and discourses, to which is added an enlarged memoir of the author. Okay, this is volume one of three. And it was originally published in 1836. The text in question is, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. In the beginning of this chapter, Yahuwah, in a vision, brings the foreteller, Yehezkiel, or Ezekiel, into a valley full of dead men's bones, quite dried and withered and asks him the question if he thought it was possible for these dry bones to live, thereby intimating that although it was a thing impossible with men, yet it was easily affected by the almighty power of Elohim. And to convince him of it, he commands the foreteller to speak to the dry bones and to tell them in his name that he would make the breath of life to enter into them, which accordingly is done. For the foreteller, having in the name of Yahuwah called upon the four winds to breathe upon the dry bones, immediately life enters into them, and they come together bone to his bone, and they lived and stood up upon their feet and became an exceeding great army by which vision we have a lively representation of a threefold resurrection, as the late commentator, Mr. Henry, very well observes. One, of the resurrection of the body at the last day, and general resurrection, when Elohim will command the earth to give up its dead, and the sea to give up its dead, and when by the ministry of messengers, the dust and bones of the set-apart ones will be gathered from the four winds of the Shamayim, to which they have been scattered. Or two. Sorry about that. We have in this vision a lively representation of the resurrection of the soul or inner being from the grave of sin, which is affected by preaching or foretelling as the instrumental 
and by the powerful influence of the Ruach of Yahuwah as the principal efficient cause of it. So the principal cause of belief and resurrection is the Ruach of Yahuwah, but the instrument through which it's done is foretelling, which was also what preaching was counted as. And we also see a second witness of that in Revelation, where Yahukinon's told to swallow the book and foretell. Again, that was about the preaching that would be done about the very book that was being rewritten at that time. If you watch the anti mishiach for Dummies videos, it goes into much more detail about that. And the wind here spoken of is plainly to, said to be comprehended or understood of the Ruach. Verse 14, I will put my Ruach in you and you shall live. Or three, we have by this vision a representation of the resurrection of the assembly of El from the grave of her bondage and captivity in Babylon, under which they were at present detained. And this indeed is the primary and immediate scope of the vision, as is plain from the explanation that follows it, verses 11 through 14. So you can see what happened in a, a micro scale here, the immediate revelation of it also has a fuller scale, which he was actually living through at that time. After the Babylonian, the mystery Babylonian captivity being held in the sway of the Nicolaitan Catholic Christians and the enforcement of their dogmas and the removal of the truth, they were coming out of that and being revived by the preaching of the word, which led to the schism, the, the separation of the Anglican church. This is stuff that we can go into further at another time. But at this particular time in their life, it was when the cloud of Elohim's wrath was turning from them because they were reforming. They started the Reformed Church of Scotland and the Covenanters of Scotland that rededicated themselves to our Creator. That later led to the Puritans and the, 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 insta the fighting between them and the High Church Party within the Anglican Assembly that caused them to come to America or flee to the Great Wilderness is also was foretold in scripture it says however seeing the deliverance of the children of israel out of their babylonian captivity was typical of our spiritual redemption purchased by yahuwah yahushua mashiach upon the tree and in the yom or day of power applied to by the mighty and powerful operation of the set apart ruach of elohim and seeing it is this redemption with which we are under the good news are principally concerned. Therefore, I shall handle the words that I have read under this spiritual sense and meaning. M meaning that the what follows is going to be covering that aspect of this threefold resurrection that's alluded to here. And in them briefly we have one, a dismal case supposed and that is spiritual deadness. The people of Elohim were not only in bondage under their enemies, but likewise their souls were at this time in a languishing condition. Out of this more afterwards, or but out of this more afterwards, meaning he's going to talk about it more later. Two, we have a Baruch or blessed, blessed remedy here expressed and that is the breathings of the Ruach of Yahuwah. The influences of the set-apart Ruach come from the four winds, O breath, and etc. Now these influences of the set-apart Ruach are here described. First, from their nature. Held out under the notion and metaphor of wind. Come from the four winds, O breath, and just so you know, the Hebrew word for wind, breath, and spirit are all ruach. It's the same word for those three. There are three elements by which the operations of the ruach are held out to us in Scripture. Sometimes they are compared to fire. Matthew 3.11 He shall immerse you, speaking of Mashiach, 
with the set-apart ruach and with fire. Sometimes they are compared to water. Yeshayahu 44.3 I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my ruach upon your seed, and etc. And fire and water are also the two judgments. First by water, because what was last is first there, right? And then by fire. And that's something that you can even see in the name Mashiach. If you remember, I've shared with you, the. I have a whiteboard. I used to break down the paleo. And when you look at Ernest Klein's Etymological Dictionary of the Hebrew Language for Readers of English, you can break down every word into detail on every letter or every two part or every three parts of the word and everything that it means and just contemplate the truth that's found there. The sheen is fire. The maim represents water. It's literally a picture of the water, they say. But that also is a picture of the sun. It, the mem in creation for the, the Genesis account lines up with the light of the world. But the sheen is fire, mem is water. Both of those are attributed to his word, which shiach means discourse, communication, meditation. Mem is the place of or the means through which, and the means through which we meditate and have discourses through our Mashiach, the anointed, who is the word of the, from the Father right so all these things go together because it is the truth all right continuing here it says sometimes the influences of the ruach are held forth under the metaphor of wind as in canto cantillations or the song of shalomo 416 the, the songs of, of uh, Song of Songs, they call it, right? Sorry about that. 4.16, it says, Awake, north wind, and come, you south, blow upon my garden. So here, by the wind or breath here spoken of, we are principally to comprehend the Ruach. It is plainly declared to be the Ruach of El in the 14th verse of this chapter, which is... Come, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. And he was going to put his ruach in them, which they just covered, right? You also find the uh, prevalence of this, the, the ruach oath or the winds explained in the book of Hanok, where he goes into detail and talks about the benefits or the, the detriment that comes from them, depending on what which ones are opened for blowing from what from different directions. And that is also alluded to when he very plainly shows that pestilence, if you look at the Hebrew word for pestilence, it's, it's, it's almost similar to the word for word, debar, dalit, bait, resh. Because when, and you can see the example in Kings and Chronicles, when Dawid numbers the people because the people were collectively doing evil and they upset our, our creator. So he allowed Satan to entice Dawid to number them contrary to the word, then they had three choices. And he chose to fall into the hand of Yahuwah, in which case he sent pestilence through the land. <clears throat> this is, I cannot stand to show you the grounds of this metaphor. Wind, you know, is of a cleansing, cooling, fructifying nature, meaning it it promulgates the, the fruits. It helps the trees and the things to become fruitful by taking the pollen and helping it spread, right? So a cooling, fructifying nature and virtue. It acts freely and irresistibly. It is not in the power of man to resist or oppose the blowings of the wind. So the influences of the Ruach cleanse and purify the heart and ally the storms of conscience, quote, make the bones which were broken to rejoice, unquote. They make the inner being to grow as the lily and cast forth its roots like Lebanon. They render the inner being fruitful like the garden of Elohim. 
and the Ruach acts as a king or a, a kingly freedom and irresistible efficacy, as you may hear afterwards. But, secondly, these influences of the set-apart Ruach are described from their variety, four winds. Come from the four winds, O breath importing the manifold influences and operations of this one and eternal Ruach. I, I'm not going to cut in too much more because this is really, it's really self-sufficient here. But I do want to point out, Irenaeus mentions that the four good news accounts, the four winds, the four manifestations of our Mashiach in the world, the, how he came and presented himself all line up and they're all showing forth that it goes along with the four living creatures that you can see in the stars and, and above or around the throne as well the first was like a lion the book of yahukanon the east wind it's the coming with power and authority the the second is like the bull the book of luke the sacrificial element or the kohen role that he played and the third is like the man the book of Matit Yahu and his, you know, showing him forth. The first one was how he appeared to men from the garden until the times of Abraham, where he came as Elohim in the form of Elohim and he was announced as so. Then he gave the covenant. He instituted the, the sacrificial systems and the laws. And that was like the Kohen aspect, the Melchizedek role that was given. And also the Levitical law that was given. Then he came as a man, which was when he was born in the flesh. And then the eagle, or the fourth one, which lines up with the book of Mark and the last wind, is like the flowings of the Ruach, which is what he gave after he came. And those are the four manifestations lining up with the four winds, the four living creatures, and the four good news accounts. Um, this It goes into more detail in other places. Like I said, the book of Hanok covers the winds explicitly. But back on point, it says, hence we read of the north and south wind, Song of Songs 416, and of the seven ruachot, or spirits, that are before the throne of Elohim, Revelation 4.5. Thirdly, these influences are described from their acting or operation, which here is called a breathing. Breathe upon the slain. By acting of this almighty wind, our natural life was produced and formed, Genesis 2.7. We are told here that after Elohim had formed man of the dust of the ground, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living inner being or soul. Hence is that of Elhu, Job 33.4. The Ruach of El has formed me. And the breath of the Almighty has given me life. And it is by the influences of the same Almighty breath that our inner beings are quickened when dead in trespasses and sins. And our spiritual life is formed within us. <clears throat> but then, fourthly, these influences are described from the end and effect of their operation. Breathe upon these slain that they may live. That is, that the dry bones may become living inner beings, that out of these stones children may be raised up to Abraham. Now from these words thus briefly explained, I only offer you this one observation, namely, that as the generality of an assembly and tribe in covenant with Elohim may be in a very dead and languishing condition as to their inner beings, so the breathings and influences of the set-apart Ruach of Elohim are absolutely necessary for their revival. This is the sum of what I intend from these words. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. In discoursing upon this doctrine, I shall, one, Speak a little upon the deadness which is incident to a tribe or family or clan 
externally in covenant with Elohim. <clears throat> Two, upon the influences or breathings of the wind of the set-apart Ruach, which are so absolutely necessary in order to their revival. Three, touch at that life which is affected by these breathings. Four, I shall apply. One, I say, I would speak a little on this deadness which is incident to a tribe externally in covenant with El. And here I shall only, one, give you some of its kinds, two, some of the causes of it, three, some of the symptoms of it. One, the first thing is to give you some kinds of deadness. Know then, in general, that there is a twofold death. One is proper and natural. The other is improper and metaphorical. One, death properly so called is a thing so well known that it is needless for me to tell you what it is. There is none of us all, but we shall know it experimentally within a little, for it is appointed for every man once to die. The grave is a house appointed for all living, and therefore with Job we may say to corruption, you are our father, and to the worm, you are our mother and sister. But this is not the death I now speak of, and therefore, too, there is a death which is improper and metaphorical, which is nothing else but a disease or distemper of the inner being. By which it is rendered unmeet or not good and incapable for set apart and spiritual exercises. And this again is twofold, either total or partial. Now, he didn't know about the Dead Sea Scrolls at this time, and we literally have some of the works that we'd already covered about the two Ruach Oath, or the two spirits that are in every man. And it, it, it explicitly says that as you love the truth, so you are a partaker greater of the first one and cast away the other. And as you hate the truth and follow evil, you're a partaker of the other Ruach. But there's the two that influence everyone. And it's the portion of which you have in you that you're either going to be rewarded or judged at the visitation of Elohim. He goes into detail here in a different manner, but using scripture to describe that very same phenomenon. He says there's total or partial in whether or not you have the, the Ruach in you. It says, first, there is a total death incident to the wicked and unrighteous, who are stark dead and have nothing of spiritual life in them at all. Hence, Ephesians 2.1, men in a state of nature are said to be dead in trespasses and sins, that is, under the total reigning power of sin, in the gall of bitterness and under the bond of inequity, without Elohim, without Mashiach, and therefore without hope or expectation. Secondly, there is a partial death incident to believers, whom Elohim has raised out of the grave of an unrenewed state, and in whose inner beings he has implanted a principle of spiritual life. And this partial death, incident to believers, consists in a manifest decay of spiritual principles and habits, and or in the abating of their wanted life and vigor, and activity in the way and work of Yahuwah. Their steadfast fidelity, their love, their hope, and their favors are all in a fainting and languishing condition. They lie dormant in the inner being, like the life of the tree that lies hid in its roots, without fruit or blossoms, during the winter season. Such deadness as this we find Yahuwah's people in Scripture frequently complaining of, particularly Yeshayahu 56.3, the son of the stranger that has joined himself to Yahuwah and taken hold of his covenant, he is made to speak, saying, Yahuwah has utterly separated me from his people. 
And the eunuch cries out, I am a dry tree, wherein there is no life or sap. It is this kind of spiritual deadness incident to believers that I now principally speak of. The leaves of his profession may be or may in great measure be withered. The candle of his conversation may burn dimly or with very imperfect light. The flame of his affections, his zeal, love, desire, may, like that of a great fire, be reduced to a few coals and cinders. There may be a great intermission or formality in the discharge of commanded duty, meaning doing the works without love. The mind which once with delight and admiration could meditate upon El and Mashiach and the covenant and things that are above may come to lose its relish for these things and to dote upon the transitionary or transitory fading vanities of a present world. The common gifts of the Ruach, through carnal ease and defective employment, may be in a great measure blasted, and, which is worst of all, the saving favors, the fruits of the Ruach, may come to be woefully impaired as to their former degrees and actings. But now this partial death of believers again is twofold. There is a deadness which is felt by El's people, and a deadness which is not felt. Gray hairs are here and there upon them sometimes, and they do not behold them. Yahuwah has departed from Samson, and he, wist, and he knew it not. Judges 16.20 But then there is a deadness which is felt when Elohim's people have a sense of their deadness and are lamenting it, and it is an evidence of spiritual life or of some revival when Yahuwah's people are beginning to cry out with the assembly. Psalm 85.6 Will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. Why have you hardened our heart from your fear? Yeshayahu 63.17 But, number two, the second thing is to take notice of some of the causes of this spiritual deadness. I shall only name them because your time would not allow me to enlarge. One, then abstinence or neglect of food, you know will soon bring the body to a pining, languishing condition. So if the means of favor be not diligently improved, if we neglect by belief to apprehend and to improve Mashiach and to feed upon him, whose flesh is meat indeed and whose blood is drank indeed, the spiritual life of the soul will soon languish and wither. Hence is that declaration of Mashiach, Yahu Kanan 6.53. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 2. Surfeiting the inner being with sensual pleasure. This is saturating it to full, okay? Surfeiting the soul or the soul or inner being with sensual pleasure is another great cause of spiritual death. Hosea 4.11. Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. They suck out the very life of the inner being. What is the reason why many professors of religion have lost their wanted vigor in the way of Yahuwah and are in such a languishing condition as to their inner being matters? The plain reason of it is this, they are glutting themselves with the pleasures of sense. If Samson do but sleep on Delilah's lap, she will betray him into the hands of the Philistines and cut the locks wherein his strength lies. And when he goes out to shake himself as at other times, he will find his strength gone away from him. 3. Inactivity and sloth in deliverance and regeneration work is another cause of spiritual deadness. 
Physicians observe that as too violent exercise, so too much rest, or a sedentary way of living, is prejudicial to the health of the body. This holds also in spiritual things. If we do not exercise ourselves unto righteousness and endeavor to abound in the work of Yahuwah, the spiritual life will soon languish and dwindle away. Therefore, let us not be slothful in business, but fervent in Ruach, serving Yahuwah. And whatever our hands finds to do, let us do it with all our might. And beware of resting upon empty wishes and desires in spiritual matters. For the desire of the slothful kills him, because his hands refuse to labor. That's from the Proverbs. Sorry. Number four. The contagion of ill example of the carnal world and irreligious relatives has a fatal influence this way. You know it is exceedingly dangerous for those who have the seed of all diseases in them to frequent the company of those who are infected with the plague or pestilence. A Yahusif, if he stay long in the Egyptian court, will learn to swear by the life of Pharaoh. It is true, indeed, as fire sometimes burns with the greater vehemence and casts the greater heat. The colder the air be, so the zeal and life of Elohim's people is sometimes rather quickened by beholding the wickedness of those among whom their lot is cast, as Shaul among the Athenians. But if we shall adventure to cast ourselves into the society of the wicked, Without a special call and warrant from providence, it will be next to an impossibility to keep ourselves free from the contagion. For can a man carry fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? Can a man walk upon hot coals and his feet not be burnt? Evil communications corrupt good manners. 5. Some deadly wound in the inner being, not carefully noticed, may be the cause of spiritual death. You know a man may die not only by the draught of poison or the like, but also by the cut of a sword. While we are in the wilderness, we live in the very midst of our spiritual enemies. Excuse me. The fiery darts of Satan are flying thick about us. He is always seeking to bruise the believer's heel, going about seeking to devour. And not only so, but our own lusts also do war against the inner being, so that we cannot miss to be wounded thereby. And if the filth and guilt of these wounds be not carefully washed away by the blood and ruach of Yahuwah Yahushua Mashiach, they cannot miss exceedingly to impair the spiritual life and health. Therefore, Dawid, after he had been wounded by murder and adultery, is so earnest that Elohim would wash and cleanse his wounds and purge him with hyssop, so that the joy of his deliverance might be restored. But then, six, a set apart. Sorry, a kadosh has sometimes a righteous and kadosh hand, or I, I think it's supposed to be the set apart ruach, right? Has sometimes a righteous and set apart hand in this spiritual death, to which Yahuwah's tribes or people are liable by withdrawing and suspending the influences of, of his ruach from them. For as the plant and the herb of the field wither and languish when the rain of the Shemaim is withheld, so the influences of the set-apart Ruach are suspended, the, sap, the very sap of the inner being and its spiritual life go away, and Yahuwah upholds the influences of his Ruach or withholds the influences of his Ruach for many reasons, as first, he does it sometimes in a way of awful and adorable sovereignty to show that he is not a debtor to any of his creatures. However, 
because the Ruach's influences are seldom withdrawn in a way of sovereignty, it is our part to search and try if conscience do not condemn us as having a sinful and culpable hand in it ourselves. And he doesn't go into detail right here, but you can think of Job. Anyone who's suffering for righteousness sake is going to know him. He declared that he wasn't actively sinning for the things that were happening to him, but he was being punished for the sins of his youth, right? The influences of his Ruach, where you have health, well-being, and you're protected from these things, was withdrawn by his almighty sovereignty in that instance. <clears throat> Secondly, sometimes he does it to humble his people and to prevent their pride, which makes him to behold them afar off. If we were always under the lively gales and influences of the Ruach, we would be ready to forget ourselves and in danger with Shaul of being lifted up beyond, above measure when he was wrapped up into the third Shemaim. Upon this account, some of the set-apart ones have said that they have got more good sometimes by their desertion than by their enlargement. Thirdly, he does it to make them prize Mashiach and see their continual seed or in continual need of fresh supplies out of his fullness. He lets our cisterns run dry that we may come anew and lay our empty vessels under the flowings of the Baruch fountain of life that out of his fullness we may receive and favor for favor. Fourthly, he does it sometimes for the trial of his people to see if they will follow him in a wilderness, in a land that is not sown, as well as when he is feeding them with the sensible communications of his favor and ruach, to see if they will live on him by steadfast fidelity when they cannot live by sight or sense. Fifthly, sometimes he does it for their chastisement, to correct them for their inequities. And this indeed is the most ordinary cause why the Ruach of Yahuwah is suspended and withdrawn. I have not time to enumerate many of these sins which provoke Yahuwah to withdraw his Ruach. I shall only name a few. One, not hearkening not listening. This is literally from a Hebrew word that means to bend the ear to attentively pay attention, right? Not hearkening to the motions of his ruach is one great reason why Yahuwah withdraws his ruach. As you see in the spouse, Song of Songs chapter 5, there Mashiach comes and moves and calls for entrance. The spouse does not hearken to the motion. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? Upon which he immediately withdraws and leaves her, as you may read at your own leisure. 2. Lukewarmness and formality in the discharge of duty is another cause of it, as we see in the assembly, Laodicea. It made him to spew that assembly out of his mouth. And then, three, prostituting the gifts and favors of the Ruach to carnal, selfish, and base ends, to procure a name or to make a show in the world. That is another reason of it. Four, sitting against light, trampling upon the belly of conscience, that means what is revealed is light. Everything that's manifested is light. And trampling upon the belly of conscience is doing what you know to be wrong, which is what Yaakov mentions. He who knows to do good and does it not to him, it is sin. Okay. But sinning against light, trampling upon the belly of conscience, as Dawid no doubt did in the matter of Oriyahu and Bathsheba, whereby he provoked Yahuwah so far to leave him, that he cries out, Psalm 5111, Cast me not out of your sight, and take not your Kodesh Ruach from me. 
Five, barrenness and unfruitfulness under the means of favor. Yeshayahu five, meaning the law is done away with, right? We have favor now that abounds. That, that's a good way to lose the influences of the Ruach there. But Yeshayahu five, the clouds are commanded to give no rain upon the barren vineyard. And then six, and lastly, <clears throat> they not listening carefully to the voice of Elohim in ordinances and providences. This is another cause of it. Ordinances are literally his commandments, and the providences are the providential things he, he does both in scripture and in the world to teach man. Okay. Psalm 81, 11, and 12. My people would not hearken to my voice. Therefore, I gave them up into their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. And thus you have some of the causes of the spiritual deadness. I come to number three. The third thing, which was to give you some of the symptoms of it, and would to Elohim they were not too visible, rife, and common in the day, and upon the generation in which we live. I shall name a few of them to you. One, lack of appetite after the bread and water of life is a symptom of spiritual deadness, which the two Ruach oath says slackness in the search of righteousness is a sign of the adversary's Ruach within you and being withdrawn from his. You know that a man cannot be in a healthful condition that loathes his food or has lost his appetite after it. Alas, is not the manna of Hashemayim that Elohim is reigning about our tent doors generally loathed? The great truths of Elohim, which some of the Kodeshim have found to be sweeter than honey from the honeycomb, have not that savor and relish with us that they ought to have. Are not Sabbaths, sacraments, sermons, fast days, and feast days burdens to many among us, so that if they would but speak out the language of their hearts, they would be ready to join issue with these? Malachi 1.13 What a weariness is this! Whereas the inner being that is in a lively condition is ready to say of the word, it is better to me than thousands of gold and silver. I esteem it more than my necessary food. And of ordinances, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your honor dwells. And Psalm 84.10, one day in your courts is better than a thousand. Number two, though a man have something of an appetite, Yet, if he do not grow or look like his food, it looks something dangerous and death-like. The thriving Natsari is a growing Natsari. They that be planted in the house of Yahuwah shall flourish in the courts of our Elohim. The righteous shall hold on to his way, and he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. But alas, is it not quite otherwise with the most part? Many are going backward instead of forward, as it is said of Yarushalayim, Lamentations 1.8, she sighs and turns backward. May we not cry out of our leanness, our leanness notwithstanding of all the fattening means and ordinances that we enjoy. Three, you know when death takes a dealing with a man or person, it makes his beauty to fade. When with rebukes you do correct man for inequity, you make his beauty to consume away like a moth. Pale death soon alters the ruddy countenance. Perhaps the day has been, O oh believer, when the beauty of set apartness adorned every step of your conversation. Your light did so shine before men that they, seeing your good works, could not but esteem your father in the Shamayim. 
But now, alas, the beauty of your conversation is sullied and stained by the lying among the pots of sin. This says that spiritual death is dealing with your inner being. 4. Death not only wastes the beauty, but the strength also. Ecclesiastes, or Kohelet 12.3 The keepers of the house do tremble, and the strong men do bow, upon the approaches of the king of terrors. Now see if your wanted strength and ability to perform duty or to resist temptations be not abated. Perhaps the day has been when you could have said with Shaul, Master, what will you have me to do? For through Mashiach strengthening me, I can do all things. But now you are ready to faint and sit up at the very thoughts of duty. The day perhaps has been when through Satan, or when though Satan, that cunning archer, did shoot sore at you, yet your bow did abide in its strength, and the arms of your hands were made strong by the mighty Elohim of Yaakov. You were in care to beat back the fiery darts of Satan, and to stand your ground against the corruptions and defections of the day and generation. But now, like a dead fish, you are carried down the stream. Does not this proclaim your inner being to be under a sad decay? Five. Death wastes the natural heat and warmness of the body. There is a kind of chilliness and coldness that seizes a man when death takes a dealing with him. So it is a sign of a spiritual decay and deadness when lacking zeal for Elohim and his esteem and the concerns of his assembly and his kingdom is abated. Perhaps the day has been when with Dawid, the zeal of Elohim's house did in a manner eat you up, and you preferred Yarushalayim to your chief joy. But now you are almost come the length of Galileo's temper to care for none of these things, indifferent whether the work of Elohim in the land sink or swim. Laodicea's distemper is too prevalent among us at this day. We are neither cold nor hot in the things of Elohim, and therefore have reason to fear, lest we be spewed out of El's mouth. The day has been when your Ruachoth, or spirits, were lifted up in prayer, in hearing, in communicating. You were fervent in Ruach serving Yahuwah. You could rejoice to work righteousness and say, in some measure, with Dawid, I will go unto the altar of Elohim. To Elohim, my exceeding joy. But now all this set apart warmth is gone in a great measure. You are become formal and careless in the concerns of El's esteem. 6. A dead man, you know, cannot move, but only as he is moved from without. In regard, he wants a principle of motion within. So it is a sign of spiritual death, even in believers, when external motives and considerations have a greater influence in the duties of religion upon them than the internal principle of steadfast fidelity and love. When the believer is himself, the love of Mashiach constrains him in every duty. This is the one thing he desires that he may behold the beauty of Yahuwah and inquire in his temple. But when any selfish or external motive sets him at work, it is a sign of spiritual death. Other things might be added, but I hasten to speak to... Number two, the second thing proposed in the method and that was to speak a little of these breathings and influences of the Ruach of El, which are absolutely necessary for the revival of Yahuwah's people under deadness. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon thee slain, that they may live. And here I would, one, 
clear the nature of these influences in a word or two. Two, speak to the variety of these influences for winds. Three, to the manner of their operation upon the elect, they are said to breathe upon the slain. Four, speak a little to the necessity of these breathings. Five, to the several seasons of the Ruach's reviving influences. I fear your time will cut me short before I have done, but I shall run through these particulars as quickly as possible. And as you can see, they were prolific at speaking, and the only thing that constrained them from having the utmost in-depth studies for any of these things was the time of the people, because it could cut quite long. If you remember the uh, the sermon that we read from Ralph Ernstein, we had to break into two hour and a half readings over two weeks. This is first, the thing is to clear the nature of these breathings or influences and what I have to offer upon this head, you may take in these few propositions. One, you would know that the influences and gifts of the Ruach of El are of two sorts, either common or saving or delivering. As for the common influences of the Ruach, which are sometimes bestowed upon the wicked and reprobate world, I am not to speak of at this time. All I shall say about them is to tell you that they are given in common to the children of men for edification of the mystical body of Mashiach, or the spiritual body of Mashiach, until it arrive at the measure of the statue or stature of the fullness of Mashiach, as you read in Ephesians 4. And therefore, they are commonly called by divines dona ministrata, or ministratia, or ministering gifts. And this would be like the foretelling that Caiapha had, where he was not, he was not given to Tobe, but he had benefit. This is also spoken of of Bilam, the son of Beor, who foretold and was tried to, was hired to try to curse the children. It says although they have no saving efficacy upon the person in whom they dwell. Yet El, in his Kodesh Chokmah, or wisdom, makes use of them for the good of his assembly in general, as we read Ephesians 4. And you can also see this example in the gifts of the Ruach from the Apostolic Constitutions. And another thing that I would tell you, likewise concerning these common influences, is that they are of an exceeding dangerous nature when they are not accompanied with delivering favor. The man that has them is like a ship having a very large sails, and but little or no ballast at all, in the midst of an ocean, and is therefore in danger of being split in pieces against every rock. In Matthew Yahoo 7.22, we read of some who had extraordinary common gifts, they foretold in Mashiach's name, wrought miracles and cast out demons in his name, and did many wonderful works, and yet Mashiach utterly disowns them. I do not speak of these common influences now, but of the delivering, or but of such as are delivering, and therefore, two. A second proposition is that the Ruach HaKodesh of Elohim, considered in his particular economy in the work of redemption, meaning the Ruach, which could have been she, but that's for another time, as the applier of the Redeemer's purchase, is the author and efficient cause of all delivering influences. It is he, I say, that prepares and disposes the inner being of man for the entertainment of the things of Elohim, which are not received nor discerned by the natural mind. It is he that plows up the fallow ground of the heart, 
and brings in the wilderness and turns it into a fruitful field. It is he that garnishes the face of the inner being with delivering favors of the Ruach. These are flowers of the upper paradise, therefore called the fruits of the Ruach. Galatians 5.22 It is he that preserves, cherishes, and maintains them by renewed influences. He cherishes the smoking flax and at last turns it into a lamp of esteem in Shamayim, for he brings forth judgment unto victory. It says the, the smoking flax he will not quench, right, until he brings forth judgment unto victory. Number three. Again, you would know that the elect of El are the subject recipients of all delivering influences of the Ruach of Elohim. I say they are peculiar only to the elect of Elohim and to them only upon this conversion or upon their conversion when they come to be united to Mashiach as members of his mystical body. We must be engrafted into this true olive tree. Otherwise, we can never partake of his sap and receive out of his fullness favor for favor. That these influences are peculiar to the elect of Elohim is plain from Titus 1.1, where we read of the amuna, or belief, of Elohim's elect. 4. These influences of the Ruach are given for various ends to the elect of Elohim. The judicious Dr. Owen in his discourses on the Ruach observes that these saving influences are given to the elect of Elohim for regeneration, to the regenerate for sanctification or set-apartness, to the set-apart for consolation, and to the comforted Nazarene for further upbuilding and edification and establishment until they arrive at perfection in esteem. But the nature of these influences will further appear from 2. The second thing proposed, which was to speak a little to the variety of these influences on of the Ruach. You see, they are diversified here. While they are called four winds, come from the four winds, O breath, and in the book of Hanok, even within each wind, there's different varieties, depending on which door is open. This is the emissary tells us that there are diversities of gifts and operations, but the same Ruach, 1 Corinthians 11.4. And we read, as I was telling you, of the seven Ruach Oath, or spirits that are before the throne, Revelation 1. Here, if time would allow me to enlarge, I might tell you that the delivering influences and breathings of the Ruach are either primary, fundamental, and absolutely necessary for deliverance, or they are accumulative, additional, necessary only for the believer's comfort and well-being. Some of these influences are antecedent or preparative unto conversion. Some of them are regenerating, and others are subsequent or posterior unto regeneration. But I shall not stand upon such subtle distinctions. You may take a few of them in the following order. And I don't want to be confusing to you. Antecedent and preparative, meaning they happen before your conversion, posterior and subsequent or after your conversion, right? But he's not making a distinction in general, he was just saying that they are and they do exist in such a fashion. But number one, there are the convincing influences of the Ruach, Yahukanon 16, 8. And when he is come, he will convince the world of sin. This is what I conceive we are to comprehend by the north wind, Song of Songs 4, 16, which is commonly boisterous or boisterous, cold, chill, and nipping. 
The elect of El by nature lie fast asleep within the title mark of Elohim's wrath, upon the very brink of everlasting ruin, crying peace, peace to themselves. The Ruach of Yahuwah comes like a stormy north wind, blows hard upon the sinner's face, and awakens him, breaks his carnal peace and security, brings him to himself, and lets him see the danger, or lets him see his danger, fills him with remorse and terror. Hence, yes, Yahoo 28, 17. The hell is said to sweep down the refuge of lies before the sinner come to settle upon the foundation that Elohim has laid in Zion. In Acts 2.37, it is said, They were pricked in their heart, and then they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? There are the enlightening influences and breathings of the Ruach. West, hence, he is compared to I salve, Revelation 3.18. You have received the unction from the set of part one, whereby you know all things. Yahukanon 2.20. We read Yeshiyahu 25.7. Of a veil and face of a covering that is spread over all nations. The wind of the set apart Ruach must blow off this veil of ignorance and unbelief, and then the poor sinner comes to see a new world of wonders that he never saw before a wonderful great Elohim, a wonderful Redeemer, a wonderful covenant, and a wonderful set apart law or Torah. Hence, we are said to be translated out of darkness into his marvelous light. The Ruach searches all things, yea, even the deep things of Elohim. And 1 Corinthians 2.12, By the Ruach we know the things that are freely given to us of Elohim. There are the renewing influences of the Ruach. We are said to be delivered by the washing of regeneration and renewing of Ruach HaKodesh, Titus 3.5. Hence he is called a new Ruach. He renews the will and makes old things to pass away, and all things to become new. 4. They are the comforting influences, or there are the comforting influences of the Ruach. This is the south wind, as it were, gentle and easy and refreshing, and therefore he is called the Comforter. And indeed his consolations are strong consolations. They put more gladness into the heart than corn, wine, and oil in abundance, fill the soul with a joy that is unspeakable and full of esteem. And then, five, there are the cooperating and strengthening influences of the Ruach, by the breathings of the Ruach, the feeble are made like Dawid, and as the messenger of El before him. It is he that gives power to the faint, and increases strength to them that have no might. It is by him that Worm Yaakov is made to thresh the mountains, and beat them small, and to make the hills as chaff. And then... There are the drawing and enlarging influences of the Ruach. Draw me, says the spouse, we will run after you. The poor believer lies many times, as it were, windbound, that he is not able to move a step in the way of Yahuwah. But oh, when the Ruach of Yahuwah comes, then come liberty and enlargement. I will run the way of your commandments, says Dawid when you have enlarged my heart, to wit, by the influences of your Ruach. And that's in Psalm 119. <laughs> he is like oil to the chariot wheels, and when he comes, they are as the chariots of Aminadab, or a willing people. 7. There are the sin-mortifying and sin-killing influences of the Ruach. 
we through the Ruach are said to mortify the deeds of the body so that so we may live. When this wind of the Ruach HaKodesh blows upon the inner being, he not only makes the spices to revive, but he kills the weeds of sin and corruption, making them to wither and decay, so that the poor believer who was crying, Wretched man, what shall I do to be delivered from this body of death? Is made sometimes to tread upon the necks of these enemies as a pledge of his complete victory at last. And then, eight. There are the interceding influences of the Ruach, Romans 8.26. The Ruach makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He intercedes in a physical and efficient way. He makes us to wrestle and pray. Therefore, he is called the Ruach of favor and supplications, Zechariah 12.10. Sorry about that. I'm going to start at 8 again because I lost exactly where my spot was. But it says, there are the interceding influences of the Ruach, Romans 8, 26. The Ruach makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He intercedes in a physical and efficient way. He makes us to wrestle and pray. Therefore, he is called the Ruach of spirit and supplications or favor, the Ruach of favor and supplications, Zakariyahu 12, 10. And I remember reading that part now, so I'm sorry about that. He fills the believer's heart and mouth with such a Shamayim rhetoric that El is not able to withstand it. Hence, Yaakov had power with the messenger and prevailed, for he wept and made supplication unto him. And then... 9. There are the sealing and witnessing influences of the Ruach. He witnesses with our inner beings that we are the sons of Elohim. He bears witness of the esteemed fullness and suitableness of Mashiach to the inner being. The Ruach shall testify of me. Yahukanon 15.26 and he is said to seal believers to the day of redemption. And his seal is the earnest of esteem. Ephesians 1, 13, 14. You are sealed by the Ruach HaKodesh of promise, which is the earnest of the inheritance. Yet these things I have not time to insist upon. So much for the second thing. Three, the third thing that I proposed here was to speak a little to the manner of the acting or operation of these influences, or flow it is that this wind blows upon the soul. I answer, one, the wind of the set-apart Ruach blows very freely. The Ruach acts as an independent sovereign, Yahukanon 3.8. It does not stay for the command, nor stop for the prohibition of any creature. So the breathings of the Ruach are sovereignly or kingly free, as to the time of their donation, free as to their duration and continuance, free as to the measure and free as to the manner of their working. And then, two, he breathes upon the inner being sometimes very sparingly. Or ever I was aware, says the spouse, my inner being made me like the chariots of Aminadab, which again means a willing people. Can you not seal this in your experience, believer? that sometimes when you had gone to duty in a very heartless and lifeless condition, perhaps beginning to raise foundations, and to say with Zion, Yahuwah has forsaken, and my Elohim has forgotten. A gale from Shemaim has in a manner surprised you, and set you upon the high places of Yaakov, 
and made you to cry with the spouse. It is the voice of my beloved. Behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. His anger endures for but a moment, or but for a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Three, these breathings and influences of the Ruach are sometimes very piercing and penetrating. The cold nipping north wind you know goes to the very quick. The sword of the Ruach pierces even to the dividing asunder of inner being and Ruach, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Wind you know is of a very seeking, penetrating nature. It seeks through the closet chambers, or it seeks through the closest, closest chambers. So the Ruach, which is the candle of Yahuwah, searches the lower parts of the belly, or the inner parts of the heart, right? He makes a discovery of these lusts and idols that skulk in the secret chambers of the heart. Four, the breathings of this wind are very powerful, strong, efficacious, or efficacious, I'm not saying that right, efficacious, who can oppose the blowings of the winds. Some winds have such a mighty force with them that they bear down, overturn, and overthrow everything that stands in their way. So the Ruach of Yahuwah sometimes, especially at first conversion, breaks in upon the inner being like the rushing of a mighty wind. As he did upon the emissaries, breaking down the strongholds of inequity, casting to the ground every high thought and towering imagination of the inner being that exalts itself against Mashiach with a powerful and triumphant efficacy. Effectiveness, right? He masters the darkness of the mind, the contumacy and rebellion of the will, and the carnality of the affections the enmity of the heart against Elohim and all spiritual wickedness that are in the high places of the inner being are made to fall down at his feet as Dagon did before the Ark of Yahuwah. Five, although, and if you're not familiar, in the times of the judges, when the people were sinning, Eliyahu's the Kohen at the time, Eli's children were also apostate. The Philistines had victory over them and took the ark and took it into their own cities, had it going around, but they had put it in the temple of Dagon. And when they woke up in the morning, he was bowed down before the ark. They set him back up. The next day he was bowed down and his arms were broken in his head. I think, I believe it was the arms and head, but they were broken and on the uh, threshold of the door. All parables and symbolism number five although he acts thus powerfully and irresistibly yet it is with an overcoming sweetness so as there is not the least violence offered to any of the natural facilities of the inner being for wherever the ruach comes with his delivering influences He sweetly overcomes the darkness of the mind. The sinner becomes a volunteer and content to enlist him a soldier under Mashiach's banner. Psalm 110.3 Your people shall be willing in the day of your power. No sooner does Mashiach by his ruach say to the inner being, follow me, but immediately they arise and follow him. Behold, we come unto you, for you are Yahuwah, our Elohim. Then, six. There is something in the breathing of this wind that is incomprehensible by reason. Yahukanon 3.8 You hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it comes and whither it goes, says Mashiach. So is everyone that is born of the Ruach. 
There is something in the operation of the eternal Ruach and his influences beyond the reach, not only of the natural, or not only of natural, but of set apart reason. Who can tell how the bones are formed in the womb of her that is with child? And it mentions elsewhere that we ourselves will comprehend all things, but will not be comprehended by any. Speaking of the Ruach, me, or spiritual man, right? So far less can we tell how the Ruach forms the babe of favor in the heart, how he preserves, or she rather, again, the Ruach is given a feminine aspect throughout the original covenant writings and in the explanation of the difference between the father, his son, and the Ruach by Kepha, it, she's, it's called a she, and it's only called a he in the renewed covenant writings because spiritus is a masculine word. Ruach is feminine. This is how he or she, she preserves, maintains, and cherishes the smoking flax that is not quite extinguished. We may, in this case, apply the words of the psalmist, psalmist in another case and say, your way is in the sea and your path in the great waters and your footsteps are not known. And that of the emissary, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. <clears throat> Seven. These influences of the Ruach are sometimes felt before they are seen, as you know a man will feel the wind <clears throat> and hear it when he cannot see it. So it is with Yahuwah's people many times, on whom the Ruach breathes. They feel his actings, they are sensible that he has been dealing with them, and all that they can say about it is, with the man that was born blind, one thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. The kingdom of Shemaim comes not with observation. Four. The fourth thing proposed was to speak a little of to the necessity of these breathings. And here I shall show, one, that they are necessary. Two, to what things they are necessary. One, that they are necessary will appear first from the express declaration of Mashiach, Yahukanon 15.5, without me, you can do nothing. That is, without the aid and influences of my Ruach. <clears throat> Excuse me. He does not say without me, you cannot do many things or great things, but without me, you can do nothing. And this is also explained that in by Kepha, where Yahushua is in the minds of all men, he's ever present with us, but with those that are unbelieving, he is dormant, right? <clears throat> Secondly, it is evident from the express acknowledgement of the set apart ones of El upon this head, 2 Corinthians 3 5. We are not, says the emissary, sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves but our sufficiency is of Elohim that, or sorry, it is he that must work all our works in us and for us. Thirdly, it is plain from the earnest prayers of the Kodeshim for the breathings of this wind, Song of Songs 416, awake north wind and come, you south and blow upon my garden. Psalm 85, 6, will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? There are promised, or they are promised in the covenant, and therefore necessary. Yeshayahu 44, 3, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my ruach upon your seed, and etc. <clears throat> Yehez Kiel or Ezekiel 36, 27. I will put my Ruach within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Now there is not 
a loving kindness promised in the covenant that can be lacking. But two, to what are these breathings necessary? I answer they are necessary first <clears throat> to the quickening of the elect of Elohim when they are stark dead in trespasses and sins. Can ever the dry bones live unless this omnipotent wind blow upon them? It is strange to hear some men that profess Nazarene or belief talking of the power of their own wills to quicken and convert themselves. They may as well say that a dead man may take his grave in his two arms and lay death by him and walk. No man, says Mashiach, can come to me, except the Father which has sent me draw him. Oh, what a dead weight is the sinner that the fullness must draw. For both Father and Son draws the sinner by the breathings of the Kodesh Ruach. Secondly, <clears throat> these influences are necessary for the suitable discharge of every duty of religion. You cannot read, you cannot hear, you cannot pray or praise, you cannot communicate to any advantage unless the wind of the Ruach HaKadosh blow upon you. It is Yahuwah that must enlarge our steps under us and make your feet like hind's feet in the ways of Yahuwah. Thirdly, they are necessary for the accomplishing our spiritual warfare against sin, Satan, and the world. We will never be able to combat with our spiritual enemies if he do not help us. It is he only that must teach our hands to war and our fingers to fight, so as bows of steel may be broken in pieces by us. Without the Ruach, he will fall before, or we will fall before every temptation. Like Kepha, curse and swear that we never knew him. Fourthly, they are necessary to the exercise of favor already implanted in the inner being. As we cannot work favor in our hearts, so neither can we exercise it without the renewed influences of the set apart Ruach. Cantillations or Song of Songs 416. When this wind blows, then, and never tell then, do the spices flow out. Yet I shall not stand on this. The Ruach's influences are necessary to all the uses mentioned upon the second head, for conviction, illumination, renovation, consolation, enlargement, mortification of sin, and assurance of our adoption. 5. The fifth thing that I proposed upon this head was to give you some of the seasons of these influences of the Ruach. For the wind, you know, has its seasons and times of blowing and breathing. I shall name, or I shall only name a few of them to you. One, the Ruach's reviving influences blow very ordinarily in a day of conversion. This, as you were hearing, is a season when the, this wind breathes on the inner being. Yehezkiel 36, 26. When Elohim takes away the stony heart and gives the heart of flesh. He puts his ruach within them. When the inner being is first espoused unto Mashiach. So, Yeremiahu 2, 2. I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your espousals, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. 2. When the inner being has been deeply humbled under a sense of sin and unworthiness, when Ephraim is brought low and is smiting on his thigh, acknowledging his sin and folly, then the Ruach of Yahuwah comes with the reviving gale upon his Ruach, or his inner being, which again, that was part of the Reformation fulfilled in 
Britain, and America. Specifically, Ephraim is Britain, the right? But Yahusuf and, and the Northern Kingdom specifically would have been the Reformation in Europe and the Americas, the revivals that happened there. It happened through acknowledgement of being brought low and then his influences bring in on the revival. A great example of that is what started the, the Great Awakening. If you, if you remember, it's also mentioned the anti mashiach for dummies videos. It was foretold in the two witnesses reviving. And that started with sinners in the hand of an angry L, that sermon that sparked it. <clears throat> Is Ephraim, says Yahuwah, my dear son, is he a pleasant child? For since I spoke against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have loving kindness upon him, says Yahuwah. <clears throat> Three, after a dark night of desertion, when Yahuwah returns again, it is a time of sweet influences. After Zion had been crying, Yahuwah has forsaken me. My Elohim has forgotten me. Upon the back of it comes a sweet gale of the Ruach. Can a woman forget her child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget you. 4. Times of earnest prayer and wrestling, for he gives his ruach to them that ask it. This is agreeable to the promise, Yehezkiel 36, 37. Five, times of serious meditation are times of sweet influences of the ruach. Psalm 63, 5, 6, and 8. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the night watches, my inner being is satisfied with, as with marrow and fatness, and my inner being follows hard after you. 6. Communion days are sometime, sometimes days of sweet influences. Some of Yahuwah's people can attest it from their experience with the spouse that, while the king sat at his table, the spike nar sent forth the smell thereof. And when they sat down under his shadow, they found his fruit sweet to their taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. These are quotes from the Song of Songs, or Cantillations, as they call it. 7. The day of death has sometimes been found to be a day of such pleasant gales of the Ruach that they have been made to enter into the haven of esteem with the triumphant song in their mouth, saying thanks be to Elohim, which gives us the victory through our Yahuwah Yahushua Mashiach. Thus Dawid, although my house be not so with El, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordering in all things and sure, or ordered in all things and sure. For this is my deliverance and all my desire. Thus Shimon, thus Shaul, and etc. The third thing in the text and doctrine to be spoken of, or two, is the life that is affected and wrought in the inner beings of El's elect by these influences and breathings of the Ruach HaKodesh, or Ruach HaKodesh. Your time will not allow me to enlarge upon this. I shall only tell you in a few particulars what sort of a life it is. One. Just a moment. All right, here we go. All right, so one, it is a life of amuna or belief, faith, faithfulness, steadfast fidelity, trustworthiness. That's all what that word means, okay? It is a life of Amuna. The emissaries calls it so. Galatians 2.20 The life I now live in the flesh, 
I live by the Amuna or belief of the son of Elohim, who loved me and gave himself for me. And the righteous is said to live by belief or Amuna. The man is ever embracing a redeemer and the fullness of El in him, always deriving fresh supplies out of that full treasury and storehouse. Two, it is a life of being declared right. The Torah instructions pronounces a curse against everyone that does not continue in all things written in the book of the Torah to do them. The believer gets this sentence of death canceled. Romans 8.1 There is no condemnation to them which are in Mashiach, Yahushua. And not only so, but he has the everlasting righteousness of Emmanuel, meaning El with us, man imputed to him or yeah el man or the the elohim in man imputed to him so that with a set apart boldness he may challenge justice and challenge the law what they have to say against him as the emissary does in romans 8:33 who shall lay anything to the charge of elohim's elect and etc. Three, it is a life of reconciliation with Elohim. Elohim and they are at friendship, which follows naturally on their being declared right. Romans 5 1. Being declared right by belief or amuna, we have shalom with Elohim. Elohim does not retain the least grudge in his heart against them. And he and they walk together, because they are agreed. That is, they have fellowship one with another, according to that first Yahukanon one three. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father, and with His Son Yahushua Mashiach. Four, it is a life of set apartness and sanctification. So that's redundant, really because Kodeshah is sanctification or set apartness, being separated, all right? For the Ruach of Yahuwah is a cleansing, purifying, and renewing Ruach. He renews the inner being after the image of Elohim. Now, the image of Elohim is literally what a man is. Our Mashiach is Elohim bodily, and we are made in his image. But he renews our inner being after the likeness of Elohim, which is not in all men. That's explained by Kepha. <clears throat> it says, makes the heart that was a cage of unclean birds a fit temple for the set-apart Ruach to dwell in. He garnishes the inner being and makes it like the king's daughter, all esteemed within that they had lain among the pots became like the wings of a dove covered with silver and her feathers with yellow gold. Which, remember, the dove is Columbia. The silver and gold are the redemption, the redeemed. If you remember, the silver is redeemed by being put in the furnace and having you perfectly reflect the image of the refiner, and then you're taken out but the gold is completely melted and sifted and separated from the impurities to be made pure. And those would be like the ones that are not actively sinning, that are facing suffering, like Job did, <clears throat> which he even states, I'm going to come forth like gold, right? Number five, it is a very lightsome and comfortable life, and no wonder, for his name is the Comforter. His consolations are so strong that they furnish the inner being with ground for joy in the blackest and cloudiest day. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in Yahuwah. I will joy in the Elohim of my deliverance. And the joy that he gives is deep. Your heart shall rejoice, 
and it shall or and it is abiding your joy shall no man take from you and it is such as cannot be made language of we rejoice with joy unspeakable full of esteem it is a life of liberty for where the ruach of yahuwah is there is liberty he brings us into the esteemed liberty of the sons of elohim before the ruach came, comes with his delivering influences the man is in bondage in bondage to sin to satan to the torah and to the curse and condemnation of elohim but the ruach of yahuwah frees from all these Mashiach, by his Ruach, sets the captives of the mighty at liberty and delivers the prey from the terrible. 7. It is a hidden life, Colossians 3.3. 3. Your life is hid with Mashiach in Elohim. And believers are called Elohim's hidden ones, Psalm 83.3. The spring and fountain, and that was specifically in regard to the people, Yisrael, being hidden and not known, which was alluded to saying that a hardness in part has come over them until the fullness, the Meloha Goim, or the fullness of the nations, which again was foretold with the British Empire. They were Ephraim becoming the Meloha Goim is when they had their company of nations that were expanding upon and when that happened is when they started learning the truth of who they were and talking about it you can see that as early as the 1830s it was alluded to and mentioned even before then by others at different times but it was not known by the large body of the people until the fullness of the nations or the fulfillment of the promises to the children that were happening then Ephraim, Britain, is one of the 12 tribes. Only one. And they're not the only ones. That's why we shouldn't be dogmatic about things. But moving on. It says, the spring and fountain of this life is hid, namely, an unseen Mashiach, for with him is the fountain of life. The subject of this life is hid, even the hidden man of the heart. The actings of this life are hid, and the means of its support. He feeds upon the hidden manna, and the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Elohim. And then the beauty and esteem of this life is hid, for the king's daughter is all esteemed within. The beauty of the hypocrite's life lies all in the outside painted sepulchres sepulchers right the painted tombs eight it is a shamayim life or heavenly life they are made to live above the world our conversation is in the shamayim says the emissary they look on themselves as pilgrims and strangers on the earth and therefore look not so much to the things that are seen as to the things that are not seen with moshe they have respect unto the recompense of the reward. Their eyes are set upon the land that is very far off, and the king in his beauty. 9. It is a royal life, for they are made kings in Kohanim unto El. Revelation 1 6. They have a royal kingdom of which they are heirs. I appoint unto you a kingdom, says Mashiach, a royal crown, a crown of esteem which fades not away. They shall have a royal throne at last, Revelations 3.21, or Revelation 3.21, royal robes, princely attire, the garments of deliverance, a royal table provided for them. Yeshayahu 25 6. The feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, or marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. 
royal guard continually attending them, the messengers of Elohim, and the attributes of Elohim's nature, and etc. 10. It is an eternal life, Yahukanon 17.3. This is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true Elohim, and Yahushua Mashiach, whom you have sent. The delivering knowledge of a L or of an L in Mashiach. What is it but the first drawings of eternal esteem in the inner being? And where he once dawns, he is ever in the ascendant until the midday of esteem come, for his going forth are prepared as the dawn or morning. Number four, the fourth thing is to use the or is the use of the doctrine and waiving other uses that might be made of this doctrine. I shall only improve it by way of examination and of exhortation. The first use shall be of trial and examination. O oh, try, sirs, whether or not these delivering influences of the Ruach did ever breathe upon your souls, yea, or not. For your trial, I shall only suggest these few things. One, if these breathings have blown upon your inner being, man, woman, then he has blown away the veil and face of the covering that was naturally upon your mind and comprehension. He has given you other views of Ruachni or divine things, of Elohim's things, that you can have by any natural or acquired knowledge. And this is explained by Kepha. We just went over it. It's in the Recognitions of Clement, Book 8, starting at Chapter 58 to the end, where he explains that Mashiach, who is the foreteller of truth, is within the minds of all men. And to those who are simple and come to the truth with the love of the truth in pure innocence, they are given the knowledge of him because he, being a foreteller, knows what's in the mind and he knows the mind that's prepared for him. The Ruach of Yahuwah is called the Ruach of Chokmah and Revelation, Ephesians 1.17. Because he reveals these things to the inner being, which flesh and blood is not able to receive or comprehend. So then, has the Ruach testified of Mashiach unto you? Has he who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, shined into your heart to give the light of the knowledge of the esteem of Elohim in the face of Yahushua Mashiach? As or and as a fruit of consequence, sorry, and as a fruit and consequence of this, number two. If the wind of the Kodesh Ruach has blown upon your inner being, he has blown away some of the filth of hell that did cleave to your inner being, and has transformed you into his own image. Second Corinthians 3:18. Beholding as in a glass the esteem of Yahuwah, you are changed into the same image, from esteem to esteem, even as by the Ruach of Yahuwah. If you have the Ruach, the same mind will be in you which was also in Mashiach Yahushua, for he that is joined unto Yahuwah is one Ruach. You will or imitate and resemble him in his imitatable perfections, in his set-apartness, meekness, self-denial, patience. He is a set-apart, or he is set-apart, and wherever he comes, he works set-apartness and makes the inner being set-apart. Three. If this wind blow or has blown upon your inner beings, then it has driven you from your lying refuges and made you take sanctuary in Mashiach or refuge in Mashiach. He has driven you from the law, 
and made you consent to the method of deliverance through the righteousness of the Son of Elohim. I, through the law, says the emissary, am dead to the law, that I might live unto Elohim. This is the design of all the Ruach's influences, to lead sinners off from sin, off from self, off from the law, that they may rest in Mashiach only. And this is those trusting that their own works will deliver them. We've all sinned and fallen short of the esteem of Elohim, and it's only through his son's redemption that we have expectation of renewness of life. But that by means we do the things that are, that he's in, he says, if you do the things I've commanded, we're his friends, and we show that we love him, right? But it's not what delivers us from the wrath to come. It's belief in his son and the redemption that comes through him. If ever you felt any of the reviving gales of this wind of the Ruach, you will long for new gales and breathings of it. And when these breathings are suspended and withheld, your inner being will be like to faint, as it were, like a man that wants breath. You will pant for the air of the Ruach's influences like Dawid, Psalm 63.1. My inner being longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where is no water. Psalm 84.2 My inner being longs, yea, even faints for the courts of Yahuwah. My heart and my flesh cries out for the living El. Oh, for another gale of his Ruach in public ordinances. 5. If you have felt the breathings of this wind, you will not snuff up the east wind of sin and vanity. Yahukanon 4.14 Whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. You will not thirst immoderately after things of time. No, no, you will see them to be but mere trash and vanity. You will choose that good part which shall not be taken away from you which was Martha sitting at the feet of our Mashiach and listening to his word. You will seek those things which are above, where Mashiach sits on the right hand of Elohim. 6. If this wind has blown upon your inner being, then you will follow the motion of this wind. You will not run cross to this wind, but will go along with it. I mean you will yield yourselves to the conduct of the Ruach speaking in his word. For as many are led by the Ruach of Elohim, these are the sons of Elohim. But say you, how shall I know if I be led by the Ruach of El? I answer, first, if you follow the Ruach, then you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. But on the contrary... You will study to impale or crucify the flesh with its or with the affections and lusts. You will be ready to cut off your right hand and to pluck out your the right eye, sins Yahuwah command or sins at Yahuwah's command. Secondly, then the way wherein you walk will be the way of set apartness. For he is a ruach of set-apartness and a way of truth. For the ruach of Yahuwah is a ruach of truth, and he leads into all truth, a way of uprightness. Psalm 143.10 Your ruach is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Thirdly, you know leading imports spontane or spontaneous and willingness. There is a great difference between leading and drawing, between being driven by the wind and following the motion of the wind. Sometimes indeed the wicked, a hypocrite, a natural man, by a strong north wind of conviction, may be driven on to duty through the force of terror, but the believer is a volunteer. He freely yields himself to the Ruach's conduct. 
he rejoices to work righteousness and to remember El in his ways. Whenever he hears the Ruach whispering in his ears, saying, This is the way, walk you in it. Presently he complies. When the Ruach of Yahuwah says, Come, he immediately echoes back again and says, Behold, I come unto you, for you are Yahuwah my Elohim. Now try yourselves by these things. The second use shall be exhortation. Is it so that the influences of the Ruach are so necessary in order to our revival? Then be exhorted to look up to Shemaim and cry for the breathings of the Ruach. O oh, sirs, will you turn the words of my text into a prayer? And say, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I might enforce this exhortation by many motives. I only name them. <clears throat> Motive one, consider that spiritual deadness is very prevalent in the day in which we live. This was written in 1715. It's even worse today. There is a great multitude of dry bones scattered up and down our valley of vision. There are many that carry the marks of a deadly leprosy on their foreheads, their atheism, their profanity, irreligion, and other gross abominations plainly declare to the world that they are dead in trespasses and sins. And alas, may it not be for matter of lamentation that even many of those who, in the judgment of charity, have the root of the matter the principles of spiritual life, are yet under sad decays of the life of favor. Alas, it is not with Scotland's ministers and professors as once it had been or has been. I might produce many melancholy evidences of this, if time would allow. Remember those already mentioned, the general loathing of the word, and etc., Motive 2. Consider the evil and danger of spiritual deadness. The evil of it will appear first if you consider that it is a flame or that it is a frame of spirit directly contrary to the command of Elohim. Elohim commands us to present ourselves a living sacrifice unto him, and indeed this is our reasonable service. Romans 12.1. Yea, it is contrary to the very nature of Elohim, for Elohim is Ruach, and they that worship him must worship him in Ruach and in truth. 1 Yahukanon 4.24 Secondly, the evil and danger of it appears further from this, or farther from this, that it unfits the inner being for every duty and mars our communion and fellowship with Elohim. Elohim meets the lively Nazarene in the way of duty. You meet him that rejoices and works righteousness, those that remember you in your ways. But for a man that comes to him with a Laodicean, dead, lifeless, and lukewarm frame of inner being, he will not hold communion with that man. No, he will spew him out of his mouth. <clears throat> Thirdly, it opens a door for all other sins and renders a man an easy prey to every temptation. A dead man can make no manner of resistance. He is carried down the stream without opposition. Then, fourthly, it lays a foundation for sad and terrible challenges from conscience. Dawid's spiritual deadness brought him to that pass in the end that he is made to cry out of broken bones and etc. Motive 3. Consider that as the breathings of the Ruach are necessary for every duty, so particularly for that solemn work which you have before your hands of commemorating the death of the exalted Redeemer. 
I might here let you see how the influences of the Ruach are necessary for every part of your work, if time would allow. Without the Ruach's influences of light, you can never examine yourselves to purpose. It is the Ruach of the Almighty that gives comprehension. How to search out the mystery of inequity in the heart, which is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And then, without the Ruach, you cannot mourn for sin. For it is the kindly influences of the Ruach that thaws the heart into evangelical tears. Zakar Yahu 12.10 Without the Ruach, you cannot discern the broken body of the Redeemer. For it is the Ruach that testifies of Mashiach. I will pour the Ruach of favor upon the house of Dawid and the inhabitants of Yarushalayim. And then follows, They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him. In a word, you cannot exercise any favor. You cannot wrestle in prayer. You cannot have any right view of the contrivance of redemption. You cannot take hold of Elohim's covenant or improve any promise of the covenant without the Ruach. Motivation 4. Consider the excellency of these influences of the Ruach. First, they blow from an excellent quarter and original. The set-apart Ruach is the author of them, and you know he proceeds from the Father and the Son, so that they, yachad, as it were, mean united into one, convey themselves with these breathings. And as the Mashiach is the bosom or the word from the bosom of the Father that goes forth and creates all things that he desires, so the what our Mashiach speaks is the Ruach and truth and accomplish the very things that he spoke into existence. Secondly, they are the purchase of the Redeemer's blood and therefore excellent. There is not the least favor or the least gale of the Ruach that is given to believers, but it cost Mashiach the blood of his heart. He purchased favor as well as esteem. Thirdly, these influences of the Ruach, as it were, supply Mashiach's room while he is in esteem. And truly, sirs, I may safely lay upon Scripture warrant that the presence of the Ruach with believers upon earth is a greater Baraka than the mere bodily presence of Mashiach. And therefore, Mashiach tells his taught ones by way of comfort, Yahukanon 16.7, If I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. As if he had said, when I am gone, the Ruach will be poured out from on high, which is far better for you than my bodily presence. Fourthly, <clears throat> these breathings of the Ruach are pledges of esteem, the earnest penny of the inheritance, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. After that you believed, you were sealed with that set-apart Ruach of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Fifthly, their excellency appears from the excellent effects that they produce upon the inner being. They beautify the inner being on whom they fall and make it like a field which Yahuwah has Baruch. They render the inner being fruitful in every good work and or every good word and work. Hosea 14:5. I will be as the dew unto Yisrael, and what follows? He shall grow as the lily, and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. Yeshayahu 44.3 I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my ruach upon your seed, and my baraka, or blessing, upon your offspring. 
and then follows. They shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. And if you remember, the willow is also a parable that's given to the shepherd of Hermas in the parables there. And it mentions that the willow loves life. If you look into that tree itself, you can cut off a branch, stick it in a thing of water, and it'll start growing roots. Then you can use that water to do the same thing, um, to have other things grow roots from cuttings. So it's a very interesting phenomenon. <clears throat> Quest, or question rather, what advice or counsel do you give in order to our obtaining or recovering the enlightening and reviving gales of the Ruach? Answer, one, be aware of your deadness and mourn over it. For Yahuwah comforts them that mourn in Zion. He will give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the Ruach of heaviness. And then follows, they shall be called trees of righteousness, the planting of Yahuwah that he might be esteemed. Yes, Yahu 61, 2 and 3. 2. Be much upon the mount of, Elo, of Elohim's meditation. For here it is that the Ruach of Yahuwah breathes. While I was musing, the fire burned, says Dawid, Psalm 39, 3. Psalm 63, 5, 6. When I meditate on you in the night watches, my inner being shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. Three, and I was just reminded here, when in the Apostolic Constitutions, it says seven times in a day, I'll praise you. And it enumerates the, at sunrise, the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, at sunset, and then last light. And from sunset to last light is usually when the believers would be gathered together to meditate on the word and go over it, which is part of doing that in the night watches, if you will. You can also do that literally on your bed. The last part of that time that you acknowledge him during the light portion and change of state is at cock crowing, by the way. But three, cry mightily to El for these influences that he would pour down his Ruach from on high. For if you, being evil, says Mashiach, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Shemaim father give the set apart Ruach to them who, that ask him? Luke eleven thirteen. Plead the promises of the new covenant, or the Brit Hadashah, and particularly be thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I'm sorry, and particularly be much in pleading this absolute promise of the Ruach, Yeshayahu 44.3. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my Ruach upon your seed and etc. Ezekiel 36.27. I will put my Ruach within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. But still remember that these promises are to be managed by the prayer of belief. We are to turn Elohim's promises into prayers, for it is added, verse 37, For these things I will be inquired of by the house of Yisrael, to do it for them. And this is why he says, Ask in belief and it shall be given to you. We can literally go to this. It's the established law from eternity. And he, he does not change his word or will. We can bank on the promises of Scripture. Four, make conscious of waiting on him in all the duties and ordinances of his appointment, particularly the preaching of the word, and beware of a legal frame of ruach or spirit in your attending upon these, or upon these ordinances as if thereby you could merit anything at El's hand, or as if Elohim were obliged to you for what you do this way. For we receive the Ruach, says the emissary, not by the works of the Torah, but by the hearing of belief. 
good news ordinances are the usual chariots in which the Ruach rides when he makes his entrance at first or when he returns into the inner being after absence. Meaning that you'll do the things that are written when you have the influence of the Ruach in you, which is also mentioned by the two spirits, the two Ruach oath that rule over men and in the Shepherd of Hermas and the other places that it talks about these things, which we already went over. And five, lastly, study to have union with Mashiach, for it is upon them that are in Mashiach that the Ruach of El and of esteem rests. He that is joined unto Yahuwah is one Ruach with him. The oil of gladness that was poured upon the head of our exalted Aharon runs down upon the skirts of his garments, upon every member of his mystical body. Which, that's a nice parable there. That's explained by, I believe it's, um, I believe it's in one of the explanations from the taught one of Irenaeus. Hippolytus, I think his name was, when he mentions that the oil being poured on the head is from our Mashiach and it runs down on the beard, which was the Zakanim, the elders, and then onto the collar of his robe. And the robe was representative of his body, which, or the body of believers, which was all of one, of one without seam that was not torn or divided, but was cast lots for. All right, thank you all for your time. You have a wonderful Shabbat, the rest of your Shabbat and Shabbat Tov ahead, and we'll see you next week.